I wish I could sing like that. Maybe in a man's voice, but, you know. That was awesome. That's one way I like that song. All right. Um, today, we're going to talk about four different things that, uh, according to what I found on the Internet, are some of the most important decisions we'll ever make in our lives. Some of the decisions that will have the most impact, good or bad, on each and every one of us. And um, so it, it's a lot to talk about, and I'm glad that it's only 1147. That means I, have a, I can preach for a good 45 minutes, right, George? He said yes. So, um, But uh, I do have some handouts. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint, um, but I do have some handouts. Now, just keep in mind, uh, yeah, actually, thanks, guys, um, if you want to hand these out for me. Uh, I have 50 copies. I, I'm not good at counting, but I would, I would invite maybe the heads of households you, you know, every, everybody doesn't need one. So as long as each group that leaves together has at least one copy, I think we'll be good. Because these aren't necessarily a sermon outline. What they are is actually a foundation and a platform in which to continue a very important discussion um, with your friends, your family, those who are in your, your close circle. So um, again, this isn't an outline, so I'm, I'm going to touch on each one of these points but you're going to notice that I'm going to talk about things that aren't on there, and I won't talk about some things that are on there uh, for an invitation for you to continue this conversation. Um, I'm a teacher, not a preacher, so maybe that's coming out here a little bit, but you do have an assignment when you leave here, and that is not to just throw that in the trash can, but to take it home and with your spouse, with your significant other, with your children, with your family friends, talk about this. And uh, hopefully it will help you to build a very firm foundation in some of these most important topics. So let's start off here with topic number one, because we don't want to waste any time. Let's just get right into it. Um, the four points, just to kind of give a little outline on that. The four points are, number one, your view on love. Okay, what is your view on love? Number two, um, the decisions in your view on resources. And when I say resources, I mean financial and, and the things that we consume and use and manipulate in life. Number three, decisions on health. And finally, the fourth is how we use our time. Okay? It was interesting. I was, I was online. I, just, I, I had kind of a hunch on what some of these were as far as these talking points for today. And... Um, I condensed them down into these four because these four categories seem to um, cover a lot of really major things in life when you really break it down. So um, let's have a quick word of prayer as we get started here. Um, I know George already prayed, but I uh, just had one more prayer, and then we'll get started. So let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for the Sabbath day that you've blessed us with. We thank you for everyone who's here. We thank you for those who aren't here but might be listening at home. Um, I want to pray for our church family, our friends, our community. Um, uh, Lord, just pray for Scottsdale in the Phoenix area. Um, we pray for your will and your spirit to be felt and for you to dwell here and, and stir the hearts of, of your people, Lord, to help us rise above and to, to seek the standard that you have set before us. And that standard is Jesus Christ. And uh, we just invite you to be here with us this morning, be in our hearts, clear our minds, purge this sanctuary and each person in it from any evil influence that might separate us from you and your word. And we just invite you to form a hedge of protection around us and help us to leave here better acquainted with who we are and who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, the first one I want to talk about here is our decisions on love. I should segue this with uh, why I chose the title I did. I'm going to be real honest with you. I don't know why I titled this God's Way or the Highway. That sounds kind of harsh. Um, I had a coach in, um, in college who said, it's my way or the highway. And it was kind of a dictatorial, you know, alpha type. You know, I was like, oh, my goodness. And that wasn't my intent. I just want you to know that. Um, I don't want to paint a picture of God like, you know, it's my way or that. Although, when you really break it down to the fundamental, it kind of is God's way or the highway. But he has so much grace and mercy, and it's saturated with so much love that it it's easier to receive, I think, than someone standing with their finger pointing at you. It's my way or the highway. So we could say God's way or the highway, the highway to heaven, right? So uh, I, think, I think the reason I chose this is we just got back from a road trip, um, and uh, I, I've been driving all over with the kids and my family. I went up to, um, flew up to Walla Walla, 
drove back with my son and daughter, um, and then we got back, rested for a day or two, and then we drove to Colorado, and then we had to drive over to Utah to get my son's car, who blew up, and, well, we didn't get it. We got the stuff out of it. So his car is in the graveyard in Utah, the car graveyard, and uh, so we've had a pretty busy last couple weeks. It seems like when school got out, just the life just kind of accelerated there for a little bit, and uh, so we're kind of nice. We're home again, and hopefully things will smooth out and settle down. So God's way or the highway, don't let that title um, dissuade you. Point number one, decisions on love. The reason I, I chose this one and I put it first is because I think this is a very important topic. And I want to go to the book of Genesis. So if you have your Bibles with you, let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Because I heard a quote by one of my students, actually. His name is KJ. And um, he, he, I think, preached here once. Uh, he was a senior. He just graduated from Thunderbird Adventist Academy. And he said this one time in one of his talks, and I told him I wrote this down, and I also told him I would give him credit for it. Now, I don't know whether he gleaned this from someone else, but he did say it, so I'm going to quote KJ. He said, real confidence is believing what God believes about you. And when he said that, the hair on the back of my neck stood up, and I'm like, amen, brother. Real confidence is believing what God believes about you. Let's see what God says about us in Genesis chapter 1, starting in verse 26. Then God said, let us, plural, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the Godhead. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. Now, I believe man here is a generic term, meaning mankind, because it goes on to say, in the image of God, he created him. And then it says, male and female, he created them. Complementary beings that were created to resemble the Godhead, a plurality. Without Eve, Adam would not have been the perfect reflection of God because he would have been one, okay? Okay. I want to read a quote to you that I got from um, Ty Gibson. It was so good, I, had to, I actually wrote it in the back of my Bible. Um, I have a lot of random little things written back here. This is the essence of love by Ty Gibson in his book, A God Named Desire. Ty Gibson says, Three is the essential numerical value of love. Three, okay? Kind of makes sense. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Adam and Eve, and they were to be fruitful and multiply, okay? There is an order, there is a purpose, there is a sacred order and assignment that God gave mankind in the beginning. And that assignment and that order and that purposeful creation is a perfect reflection of God, okay? So three is the essential numerical value of love. Where there is only one person, love cannot occur. Where there are two, each is the sole recipient of the other's attention, giving place for self-absorption. But the moment there are three, each recipient of one's love must also humbly defer attention to the third party, and each one is the third party to the other two. Pure selflessness can now occur by virtue of the fact that that each one must love and be loved with both an exclusive and a divided interest. Can I hear an amen to that? God is love, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Mankind was made in God's image. We're going to make him in our likeness. Male and female, he created them, and their assignment was to produce and multiply and fill the earth. God has a purpose for us. The Bible also says that uh, there's a deceiver, okay? Um, just also another little reference here. I think as we go through this, if you're interested more in this topic, uh, something really good to listen to. Uh, my daughter Savannah and I listened to this two years ago, driving up to Walla Walla. It's a sermon by David Asherick, and it's called Hitchhiking for Love. It's a long sermon, but it is absolutely just filled with really good bites. Um, if you have a young... Person, if you are a young person, if you're single, married, if you're raising kids, if you interact with young people who are in pursuit of relationships and marriage, if you're in a marriage, it's good for everybody. A lot of really good advice. 
Um, it, is, it sets the high standard that we all will probably fail to meet. But if we don't shoot for the moon, we're going to end up... What, what's that old saying? You know, you shoot for the moon. If you miss, at least you'll end the stars or something like that. But we've got to shoot for that high standard. Um, Jesus Christ is that high standard. He sets that standard for us. And if we're just him hauling around looking at the world as our example of perfection, we are going to experience a lot of misery, a lot of strife, and a lot of uncomfortableness in this world. So, Hitchhiking for Love. Great little sermon to listen to. Okay, we're going to talk about this real quick. Um, Now, the Bible talks a lot about relationships, talks about husbands, wives, and it also talks about counterfeits that the devil has thrown into the mix. Okay, and uh, I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this because there's so many things. This is again, this p- the purpose of my sermon today is the beginning of a conversation that I hope will continue in your living rooms and around your dining room table as you're sitting with your friends and family. So um, you can agree with me, you can disagree with me. That's how conversations go. But I want to try to do my best to paint a biblical picture of what I see God trying to tell each and every one of us. Um, So the way I organize this is I give the point, um, I ask some prompting questions, I give some opinions, and then I give some Bible texts to examine and kind of use as discussion points along the way. And uh, that's for your use and and later on. So um, I want to just first start off about saying this. Um, There are, there is one example of like sex and sexuality, okay? And that example is a monogamous, lifelong relationship between a man and a woman, okay? The, the biological functionality of that is purposeful. The emotional uh, elements of that are purposeful. It is in God's order. It was before sin. God created these things. And at the end of his creation, he said, it is good, good, good. And then finally, on the seventh day, everything was done. And he looked back. And he said, it is very good, right? Amen? So we're talking about something that is, is, is in existence and was in existence before sin entered and tainted everything, okay? So this is part of God's sacred order, okay? Sexuality is something that we should not be afraid to talk about. Um, sex is something we should not be afraid to talk about. There are young people in this room, and uh, you might be mad at me for inviting this but you know what? They're going to hear it in school, and if you don't teach them what the Bible has to say about it, I guarantee they will learn from another source, and you might not like that source. So I'm pushing you into the boundaries of uncomfortableness in hopes that you will talk to your kids about this. Because I know, I remember first grade cafeteria, and I remember Lisa sitting across from me. She was another first grader, and she taught me all about it. My mom and dad hadn't had that discussion with me yet. So I started off with a pretty skewed perspective of sex and sexuality. Please, parents, don't skirt around this. Make it comfortable. Talk about it. The more you do, the easier it gets. Okay. Um, The foundation that we just read about in Genesis is God's ideal. Now, we also know that when God blesses something, he sanctifies something, he makes something holy, he gives us this sacred gift, and he has this purposeful order that the, the deceiver, the liar, the murderer, Satan, will come along, and he will throw counterfeits in, in along the way. And there are some terms that the Bible talks about. You've heard it. You, we, we know these things. It's a major issue in today's society. Um, words like... Um, uh, fornication, adultery, um, lust, homosexuality, bestiality, bisexuality, masturbation, pornography, all these things are in opposition to God's order and his design. But wait a second. You mean these are all sexual sins that, and God, God isn't like, you know, pro these things? No. But you know what God is pro? He's pro you and me. And he's giving us Jesus as an example. And we know that Jesus, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, has come. And each and every one, I'm just going to say this. I'm betting that every single person in this room has fallen to the temptation, has struggled with at least one of those various sexual sins. Okay? Well, I haven't. You know, everybody's like, 
No, I, I'm, I'm betting that each and every single one of us has. Jesus ups the ante a little bit. He raises the bar and he says, even when a man looks at a woman and lusts after her in his heart, he has committed adultery already. Ooh. That's where the rubber meets the road, right? I'm betting each and every one of us has fallen subject to some of these sexual sins. So don't go pointing fingers. We hear this all the time. We're bashing homosexuality or people addicted to pornography or, oh, you're on your third marriage or this or that, or you're living with your boyfriend or girlfriend. You know what? When you're pointing fingers to someone else, you have three pointing right back to you, right? Okay, so let's not play that game. We're not here to shame or to guilt people. We are here to paint a picture of God's ideal and his grace and his mercy and his long-suffering and the fact that he loves each and every one of us no matter what sins you struggle with. Amen? So, as you can see, there are a lot of things we can talk about here. Um, I want to say this. 1 Corinthians. Can God forgive some of these sexual sins? 1 Corinthians 6, 9 through 11. Um, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. And Paul says this right after giving a long list of sins. And in that list are several sexual sins. You say, well, well I was born like this. I'm not even going to get into that argument. Maybe you were, maybe you weren't. But I'll say this. There was a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. We are all sinners. There are a lot of ways that seem right to us because that's the way the current's going. It's easy. There's no resistance. Pop culture, media, advertisement, everything around us is encouraging sometimes us to take these wrong avenues that are opposed to God's perfect ideal. Paul, Paul also says we need to pick up our cross. He says, I die daily. We need to deny ourselves in the Christian faith. Okay? Once we realize that maybe we're struggling with a certain sin, and it, it's, it's just the way we are. We want it so bad, and we, it's not fair because, you know, I'm dealing with a sin, and you don't understand. You know what? Every single person is dealing with a sin. It might be in a different genre or maybe a different type within a genre, but we're all dealing with, dealing with sin. So don't, don't play the, you know, my case is worse than your case game, okay? We don't know the heart of a man or a woman. Only God does. And he deals with each, every one of us with grace and mercy, and we can come to the foot of the cross, and he can wash us clean. Amen? Though your sins be like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Let's go ahead and... I could talk all day on each one of these topics. Um, I know some of... Uh, Savannah, I, I had you in class before. Emma, you had, I'm on some of my high horses, right? You've heard about me talk about some of these things in class. Okay? Um, if any other students, maybe you're going to have me. I teach junior Bible. And uh, we have a little bucket, and students ask questions. And some of the... That's what I love about young people. They are not afraid to ask the nid, dirty questions that some people are too staunch and upright to even ask. But we need to ask these questions, and we need to find biblical answers. And if we can't find biblical answers, we need to be like the Bereans and keep checking and searching, because what people tell us might not be in line with God's Word. So study your Bibles. Okay, some of the more questions, uh, what does love look like to you? Um, I'm just going to tell you straight out, um, we have a lot of bad examples. We have a lot of bad examples. What does love look like to you? You better find a biblical example, and maybe there are no physical, material biblical examples, or maybe, maybe there are in your life. Um, but find good examples and try to emulate those the best you can. Um, my, my wife, I'm going to pick on my wife here for a minute. I know it's not good. We always do that, don't we? Um, but she mentioned to me one time, okay, now she, she come from a broken home. She remembers as a girl, she shared this with me, that she would look at other, quote, normal families, and she would long for that. Does that make sense? And she, would, she wanted to emulate that in her life. And, and I'm going to just tell you straight out, um, my wife and I did not start off 
quote, the right way. Um, we got married when we were 19. We are now both 47 years old. We're about ready to celebrate here in about two months our 28th wedding anniversary. Married at 19, I had grown up in a church. I had stepped out of that church. I was a proclaimed atheist. My wife, you know, just every element, every ingredient to that marriage says it's not going to work. It's not going to work. It's not going to work. We both came from, well, lower income to middle income families. We didn't have money. We were dead broke. Our first big purchase was an old used car, an old Ford Tempo. Um, and we thought, man, we're living high on the hog now. We, 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 we're doing really well. Um, I don't know how we made payments to that thing. Do you remember? Oh, my goodness. God, God had so many miracles um, when we didn't have rent and we'd get a random envelope with money. I mean, it's just crazy. But God has blessed us, and there have been challenges. There have been challenges. There have been a lot of changes in the course of these 28 years. But I'm going to tell you something. I just thought of this when I was sitting here. I was looking it up. Anybody ever seen that movie um, called um, Secondhand Lions? You know, I don't normally, I wouldn't normally recommend movies, but I, I just, I kind of like that movie. It's a cute movie. But these two old guys, they've lived this life of adventure. But one of the guys gets in a, a, a little scuff with some young punks, and he ends up beating them all up. And then he throws some steak on their wounds and takes them home, and, and he gives them the growing into a man speech. And one of the things that he said, I just love this. He says, I've won and lost a dozen fortunes, killed many men, and loved only one woman with a passion a flea like you could never begin to understand. That's who I am. And I just loved that part where he said, I have loved only one woman with a passion a flea like you could never understand. Now it's funny, it's, it's comical, but um, I can say with all my heart that I've loved my wife with a passion that a flea like, no, I'm just kidding. But a lot of people wouldn't be able to understand. And um, it's an amazing thing. When you have... Sorry, Savannah, did I embarrass you? When you have that love for someone, it just makes all the difference. But I'm going to say this. We're all touchy-feely right now, like, oh, that was so sweet. I mean, that, that quote was so cool. Love is more than feelings, okay? Because, <laughs> and I'm going to say this, young people, you can fall in love with a lot of people, but the lasting love is the one that you commit to. Does that make sense? And 30, 40 years, they're not going to look the same, right? Gravity has this weird way of taking hold of things, you know? Um, we know, right? We know. We're all there. But I'm just, I'm just saying, and that's no, that's no hit to you, Bam. You're not there yet, so you're, you're still doing good. But um, I, I will say this. Um, the commitment mixed with love is what makes a successful marriage. So when it comes to sex and sexuality, you better find out who you are and go back to that quote KJ shared, real confidence is believing what God believes about you and he created you in his image to be, if you choose to be in a marriage relationship, one woman, one man, lifelong, monogamous, be fruitful and multiply if you can and you want to have kids. I mean, that's all part of it, okay? There's enough people now that I think we have more than three so we can still experience that perfect love, right? But back when it was just Adam and Eve, they kind of had to produce some, some population, you know, on all that kind of stuff. Commitment, okay? So I'm going to leave it there. We're going to move on to the second point here because I'm, I'm ranting and raving up here. Second point, decisions about resources. Now, you might think, well, what in the world does this have to do with anything? And I am a scatterbrained person. I think I really honestly, Emma, you can probably allude to this. I have ADD, self-diagnosed. And I'm not, it's not, I'm not saying that to be funny. I, I really do. I, my mind is all over the place. I could, just shake your head, right? You've seen it before, Okay. Some of you, I, you're the only student I saw. I'm sorry I'm picking on you so much, Emma, but, you know, she always sits in class with a, a smile, and she's, I'm, I'm wondering what she's thinking, because, yeah. All right, so, um, how do we deal with our resources? What in the world does this have to do with anything? Well, I'm going to tell you straight out. How we deal with our resources can set the trajectory for, toward happiness or misery. I don't care how much money you make. There is an attitude towards money and the resources that we gain and we acquire that can really set the tone for our happiness or our ultimate disappointment and unsatisfaction. And the Bible says that the love of money is the root of all evil. 
Okay, and I want to think money is more of a general term in that context. The love of worldliness, possession, gain, acquiring things, resources, whether it be money, real estate, cars, whatever. The love of those things is the root of all evil. Those things in and of themselves aren't necessarily evil, but it's when we put them before God that they become evil. And we seek to acquire these things more than we seek to acquire and gain a knowledge and a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is evil. Okay? So I would suggest to each and every one of us that as we look at this topic, um, oops, I'm on the wrong point here. As we look at that, I just want to say a couple of things. Number one, um, let's look at, uh, let's just open up our Bibles again real quick. Pull a Bible verse up here. Let's look at Matthew 6.24. Matthew 6.24, just a quick little verse, just to kind of calibrate our minds in the right direction. Matthew 6.24 says, No one, how many people? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. And mammon is a term that refers to worldliness, wealth, different things like that. Okay? So we cannot serve two masters. So you've got to choose who you're going to serve today. And as it is written in the Old Testament, I will choose the Lord. Right? This day I will, I will choose to serve the Lord. Right? Um, what consumes your, your time? Oh, I'm on the wrong side. I wonder why that doesn't make any sense. Okay. Um... What is your relationship with money? Okay, I hear a lot of people, especially young people, like, I want to be able to retire by the time I'm 30, and I want to have three houses. And I'm... That's great. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that as long as you're using those resources for good. If your idea of retirement is to be some secluded hermit out and not have any inter interaction with somebody and just, like, live this luxurious life of wealth and ease, I would suggest that's probably not the best way to serve God. That's probably not in line with God's purpose for you. Now, is that great for a time? Yeah, we all need that. We all need a vacation, right? We all need a little time away. But if that's your sole purpose in life is to just retreat and just stay away from the world and not interact with people, um, you might want to maybe twist that thinking around a little bit. God wants to use us. So how do we use our resources? Um, how, do we, how do you consume these things? You, you know, they say that the best way to find out a person's real priorities is to look at their checkbook. What do they spend their money on? right? That's a real good way to get to know somebody. The garbage person who picks up your trash, when they look through your trash, they can see the things that you consume. Your garbage person, if they're into looking through your trash, could probably find a lot more out about you than the rest of us here in church just shaking hands once a week, right? Some of the dirty things that you might not, you know, oh, this person eats four boxes of Twinkies every week. Wow, only two people live in this. I'm sure when your garbage is disposal guy is driving by waving at you he's probably thinking oh that's the person that such and such yada 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 number three do you have a financial plan if you're single if you're married these types of things guys i'm telling you i don't care whether you are into this guy or not but we was just talking to our kids this last week about dave ramsey okay some he is i'm just going to be straight with you he's a little bit obnoxious he has very strong political views but in my personal and limited and skewed perspective I think his approach to managing money is pretty darn good. It has helped my wife and I over the last five years um, immensely. And uh, honestly, it's almost a joke because when we get our paycheck, I'm like, hey, baby, ready to do bills? And our kids are like, oh, my goodness, it's like date night for them. Like, oh, they get to do bills together. They're so excited, especially me. I don't know why. I, I just get excited watching the numbers work in our favor instead of praying how in the world we're $400 in debt this month. I don't know how we're going to pay rent. You know, we've lived those years too many, and it's not fun. If you follow God's plan, and God encourages us to be wise stewards of our money, to invest, to plan ahead, and there are several Bible verses that I've given you on here to, to discuss later on, right? So you guys are all going to do that, amen? A few. Okay, so yeah, guys, this is important. Talk about this with your kids, with your spouse. A lot of good stuff. I'll just share one quick little story on finances. 
And uh, I think we've shared this before, but there was a time when my wife and I, early, earlier in our marriage, and I think we both have this mindset, we don't like to ask for help. They already told us, you shouldn't get married at 19, you're too young. So, of course, you know, 19, 20, 21, those years, we're trying to prove ourselves, right? We don't need anybody's help. We can do it, you know. And we did need a lot of help, okay? I don't know how in the world we made it. We were eating unique things, you know. I, I got addicted to peanut butter and jelly, and I, I, still, am, I still love peanut butter and jelly. But um, we ate, you know, we, we didn't go out to eat. You know, we lived very simply. And uh, one month in particular, we literally had no money. We didn't have enough money to pay rent. We didn't know what to do. Bambi's former boss from her previous job called her up randomly and gave her this invitation to translate all of his old letters that he collected throughout his life and take out all the, the wishy-washy stuff so his current wife wouldn't be offended because they had girlfriends and stuff and previous whatever. And um, he said, I'm going to give you $400. Was it $400 or 500 it was $400 cash to get started, and then I'll pay you $10 an hour. He's like, make sure you keep track of everything. If you need to buy stuff, keep receipts. Literally out of the blue, we needed money to pay rent, and this random call came. All of a sudden, we got $400 cash and this income that she could do this whenever she wanted. Absolutely amazing. There were other times when we were standing in the back of church um, up in Flagstaff, and uh, all of a sudden, the, the church greeter comes to us and said, I got an envelope for you. The person who gave it to me doesn't want you to know who gave it. So here you go. We opened it up. It was full of cash. We needed that cash so desperately at that point in time. I don't know how they knew, but it happened. Okay? So, you know, those who have means, be keen to those needs of others. Um, those who don't have means... Get on a plan, get on a budget, and don't try to keep up with the Joneses, okay? Um, you know, the guy next door has a speedboat. You know what? If you're making $40,000 a year and you're still paying off student loans and you want a speedboat, as Dave Ramsey would say, that's stupid, okay? So, yeah, that's how he talks, so I apologize, but, you know, if you get into him, that's, that's, what, he, that's what he would say, all right? There are some good texts on there. Um, but God definitely wants us to be good stewards. He also wants us as Christians and his followers to be able to help others, okay? And he also invites us to return a portion of that which we have earned back to his purpose. That's called tithe. And he asks us to return a tenth of our increase, okay? Now, you can decide what that means for you. I remember when Bambi and I first started tithing, um, it was... Again, before we had enough money, I mean, from a worldly perspective, we didn't have enough money to tithe. We had nothing left over, but we committed to it, and we decided we were going to tithe, and then we made the decision, does tithing, is that before you pay taxes or after you pay taxes? And, you know, we kind of looked at that, and we decided for us that, you know what, why would we pay taxes before God? So we decided we were going to just do the whole, whole thing. We're just going to tithe before taxes, our gross income, and other people would say, oh, you guys are poor. You can do it. I, no, we, that's what we committed to. And God blessed that. And again, somehow it worked. And then, uh, of course, there's offerings and things like that above and beyond tithe. So I just that's an invitation. Pastor Dave didn't tell me to add that into the sermon. Um, but that is an invitation. And I'll tell you what, in my personal experience, when we started tithing, God can stretch that 90% way more than we ever got out of 100% when we didn't tithe. And that is, a, that is a promised guarantee from God's word. And he wants us to test him on that. And I'm a living testimony to the fact that it does work. All right, the third one, decisions about health. All right, I've got a few minutes left here. Um, decisions about health. What is your perspective on health? Okay, so when we know our, our decisions on love, build that foundation, how we use resources, building that foundation. Now what about our, this temple that we live in? Decisions about health. Now, some of you might know this, but I am a, a workout aholic. Is that okay? Um, I grew up. I, I started running track and cross country. I ran competitively in college. I got a scholarship to run for Ball State University. I went on to be a, a college coach. I did that for a year as a graduate assistant, and then I realized that uh, it wasn't the life for me. So, uh, but I still like to work out a lot. And um, it's interesting because sometimes 
when we get older, our bodies don't respond the way they used to when they were in our teens and 20s, okay, and even 30s now. And I used to run, this is no joke, I used to, it was my norm was about 70 to 85 miles a week is about how much I would run. So I'm, you know, I only ran six days a week, so I'd clip along, you know, 10, 12 or more miles a day. And I was also lifting weights and doing various other things along with that. Now, that's a little extreme. You don't have to be that extreme, obviously, to be healthy. Okay, I was comp- competing. And then I got into triathlons, so swimming, biking, and running. And um, we had kids, and I decided I was going to not do that because it was too time-consuming. But I've always, this, this is one area that I, I feel like I've been able to balance pretty well in my life. Um, and I've always been able to incorporate exercise into my life. It is a major priority for me. I feel better mentally, physically, and even spiritually when I exercise systematically on a regular basis. It just, it helps me a lot. And I believe firmly that it will help each and every one of you. I'm not saying you have to go out and run 80 miles a week. I'm not saying you have to do triathlons or spend two hours a day in the gym. But what I am saying is, I will say this. Thomas Jefferson said, a person should spend two hours a day on bodily exercise or he will spend two hours a day taking care of his disease. Now, two hours a day is a little extreme, and I think bodily exercise to him may have been bailing hay, tending the garden, not two hours in the gym or something like that. But long story short, even Thomas Jefferson knew the importance of being physical. God created Adam and Eve in the beginning, and he put him in a garden to tend it and to keep it. They had a physical life. Um, they've used their bodies. Okay, Jesus, his three-and-a-half-year ministry, I don't know how many miles that guy walked, but he was walking everywhere, right? Okay, was it John and the John and um, Peter, I think, ran, I don't know how many miles that was when they ran to the tomb, okay? But I think John outran Peter because he was a little bit younger. But these guys were fit enough to run, and it was several miles to the tomb. I'm guessing they weren't systematically training for the local 5K, but they were physical enough to be able to do that. And the Bible makes a point to to mention that. I think that's kind of interesting. But I will say this. Whether it's working in the garden, whether it's running or walking or swimming or riding a bike or whatever, find something physical that you enjoy to do and do it on a regular basis. How many people brush their teeth every day? We've got a dentist here. You better raise your hand. Okay? I hope that each and every person brushes their teeth at least twice a day. I hope you floss every day. I hope you take care of your oral hygiene every single day. What if we shifted that mentality toward how we take care of our hygiene and cleanliness to the fact that we can scrub our internal body by sweating out toxins, pumping blood rapidly through our veins and our vascular system to get rid of impurities, stimulate our digestive system to help eliminate wastes efficiently and regularly so we don't build up toxins and wastes in our bodies that then are circulated through us and cause disease and and tiredness and fatigue and all these different things. What if we not only brushed our teeth every single day, but what if we did something physical every single day to the point where we build up a sweat and get a little bit out of breath? Just saying I would encourage each and every one of us to do that at whatever level we can do, okay? Um, The Bible gives lots of uh, advice on health. And I want to talk about not only physical health, but mental health and spiritual health as well because we oftentimes forget those components, okay? And I'm not even going to talk about diet at all. That's very personal, okay? I would encourage you to try to seek out the best plant-based diet that fits your needs, but does that mean you have to be a vegan or a vegetarian? No. Jesus ate meat, right? Okay, so don't think that being a vegetarian or a vegan is the standard for entrance into heaven because it is not. If it becomes that, then diet becomes your God and then you, well, I don't know if we're even going to see you there, if that makes sense. Okay, so don't put diet in front of God. Okay, put God in front of that and everything else will fall into place. Okay, you have to find the diet that works for you. That's very personal. But I will say this, mental health is super important. When you are physical and you are active, um, it helps clear your mind it helps you to make better decisions. It helps to kind of just calibrate. It, it, it produces natural chemicals and endorphins and different types of things that keeps your chemistry in balance. Um, I read a book uh, years ago, and I just lost the, the name of the book, but it was talking about exercise and depression. 
Okay, depression is a real and very common issue that a lot of us have dealt with, experienced, or at least maybe know someone who's experienced it at various different levels. Exercise can help counter that. And they, they were saying that a person who is, might need medication for um, depression or various different things like that, which is, if you need it, take it. You know, if, if, if you have a fever, you take medicine to reduce the fever. Our mental health is probably even more important. So don't shy away from seeking medical advice when it comes to mental health. Depression, anxiety, those things are real. Never be ashamed to admit that, okay? Um, but if you exercise, it can help kind of counterbalance that a little bit. And if you are medicated, exercise with medication can even make it more effective. So I'm just going to say that in the research that I've done, there's a lot to be said for that. So um, be healthy mentally, physically, and spiritually. Um, I do want to share one Bible verse with you here. Um, about spiritual health. You can look through the mental and the, the physical health. <coughs> Excuse me. Let's look at Colossians 3.16. You have your Bibles. Colossians 3.16. Hopefully I can find it. Colossians 3.16 says... Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. There is a benefit that we receive when we spend time in God's word, when we spend time in prayer, when we spend time in peaceful meditation or reflection on who God is, who Christ is, maybe in nature or a quiet spot. Um... My daughter was just talking about this little spot in her dorm at Walla Walla where she likes to go early in the morning. It's uh, some fire stairwell or something like that. There's a little balcony up there. She can look out. And she, she expressed her, I guess, like and her appreciation for having a place, a physical little place that she goes to have worship. There's something to be said about that. Jesus was oftentimes found in the garden, off in the forest, in the meadows, or, you know, in the mountains. He'd go up to the mountain to pray. He would go to specific peaceful places where there weren't a whole lot of distractions, a lot of people around, and he would spend time with his father to give him strength in order to face what the day had in store for him. So I would encourage you guys to do that as well. Um, one of my favorite self-check verses for my mental, physical, and spiritual health is Philippians 4.8 right? You guys know that Bible verse, I'm sure. Philippians 4.8, um, think on these things. The, the good, um, think on what is good, what is um, lovely, and, and all these different types of things. And it says, think on these things. When we focus our mind on good things, the bad things tend to just dissipate. So mental health is very good. Uh, spiritual health, those, those kind of go long hand in hand. All right, the last one here as we're closing out. It's 1230. I promise I'll get you out here before one. No, that, I shouldn't, it, this shouldn't be that long. Um, oh, one last little thing. This is kind of a funny thing. There, there's a guy I know. He's older. He's in his mid to late 70s. And um, he has had heart surgery and um, is on seven different medications. Seven different medications. Blood pressure, cholesterol, this and that and the other thing. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, he was taking his pills one morning and he didn't have a water bottle close. So he decided he was going to wash his pills down with a slice of ham. And I was amused at his response as I was dialoguing with this man. And uh, he said that there was a dog there, and the dog was begging him for a piece of ham. He said, I didn't give the dog the ham. Everybody knows that ham is the worst thing you can give a dog. I'm thinking, what? What? What are you talking about? You're washing down all these pills for your physical health with a slice of ham that's not even good enough for the dogs. It didn't make any sense. So somehow logic got drop kicked to the curb on that one. But you know what? To each his own. Um, but I would suggest to you, if you do have to take medication, wash it down with water, not ham. Okay. The last one. Decisions on time. <clears throat> what consumes your time? Are you productive? How can you prioritize to, to you know, be more um, organized and purposeful about your time? But um, time is a huge thing. 
Time is a gift that God has given us. And he has given each and every single person in this room the same amount of time per day. Now, I don't know how long we're all going to live. I might keel over tomorrow. I might live to be 97 years old. I don't know. But today I know I have 24 hours. How am I going to use that 24 hours? Am I going to squelch it away, flipping through Instagram and, and Facebook and social media? I'll be the first to admit I've done that before, okay? And that's an issue that I struggle with. Um, our phones, some of the, the most distracting things in the world, but they're so useful too. I don't know how many times I'd be lost without my GPS on my phone. But how do you use your time, okay? Um, some people like schedules. They like to say, oh, well, such and such, I wake up, and then I take a shower, and then I have morning devotion, and then I go walk the dog, and then I eat breakfast, and then I such and such and such and such. Some people really like schedules. I'm kind of like that. And when I get a chunk of time, maybe a summer break or a week vacation, and I don't have a schedule, I find myself looking at my phone and be like, oh my goodness, it's 1230, and I haven't even done such and such yet. But if I have a purpose every day I wake up, it helps me to organize and prioritize a little bit better. So I would invite you guys to look through these points and uh, the one Bible verse that I want to look at real quick as we close is Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Exodus 20, verses 8 through 11. Does anybody know what that is? That's the Sabbath commandment. It's the longest commandment. It's the only commandment that starts with the word remember. Um, we believe the Seventh-day Adventists that it contains the seal of God, recognizes his dominion, his authority, <clears throat> different things like that. But it says here, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made action, the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. God gave us time. In the beginning, it took him six days to create everything. And he says, hold on, I'm not done yet. There's one more thing that I need to create. And that was just a space of time that was 24 hours long in order for us to commune with each other and with him and to separate ourselves from the hustle and the bustle that drags us down all the time, okay? I heard someone say when I became a Seventh-day Adventist, me personally, I was sharing this with them, and I said, you know what? <clears throat> I, I believe that the seventh day is the Sabbath, and we should rest on that day, and that's the day I go to church and various different things like that. And he said to me, well, I worship God every day. And I said, awesome. You should worship God every day. But God didn't sanctify every day and set it apart and bless it and make it holy for us to rest in. Okay, and the Bible talks about that. The Sabbath is a holy convocation to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've never gone to a convocation where I was the only person there, right? A convocation is a gathering of people for a like purpose. That's why we're here today. I pray that God blesses us. I pray that you will use the time that he has endowed you with purposefully, efficiently, resourcefully, healthfully, lovingly, all the things that we've talked about today and all the things that you're going to continue to talk about as you use these four foundational pillars that the world says are some of the most influential decisions you'll ever make in your life. I pray that you'll implement the things that we've covered and the things you're going to cover as you go through more of these Bible verses into your own lives so that you can not only receive a blessing, but that God can use you in a mightier way to be a blessing. Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you for being a God who loves us with an unending love. We have all fallen short of the glory of God. We're all sinners. We all struggle with various different things. Help us to not be finger pointers, but help us to be examples of how you can change hearts and minds and how you can <laughs> just derail us from the things that seem right to us, but in the end lead to death. I pray that our wants and desires will be your wants and desires. I pray that you will change our hearts, purge us from all iniquity, fill us with your Holy Spirit, and guide us with the light of your word, for your word is truth. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.